you'd be able to hit a ball 85 miles an hour off the tee to be considered for a Division One baseball. Yeah. Machine learning. Baseball. Batting lab? And just like that, I was on a plane to check out the batting lab at SAS. I wonder what a statistical software company that's been around for over 40 years can show me about data literacy, applied machine learning, and most importantly, if it's worth giving my baseball career another shot. Okay, so I'm really interested in what the origin story behind the batting lab is here. Obviously, it's incredibly beautiful, but how did it start? SAS created the batting lab to help kids work to improve their swing or their performance at bat. But slyly, we're hoping that they become more comfortable interacting with data outside of the classroom. So ultimately give them some confidence in interacting with data visualizations in the everyday real world. And hopefully through that sport that they love and seeing the visualizations that apply to it, they're that much more excited to interact with it when they're growing up and interacting with data everywhere. All right, so I'm with Lucy, the Education Initiatives Manager over at SAS, and she's here to talk to us a little bit about how data literacy plays into this entire awesome exposition. Yeah, so the batting lab cleverly embeds data within this very high interest area of sports. So the instructional strategy here is to use that situational interest that's brought on by baseball or softball in order to motivate an interest and appreciation for the value of data. And as a result, these kids see a completely different side of data. So one that's not isolated in the math classroom, but rather embedded in the real world and applied to the real world to help them solve a problem that they care about. All right, Maddie, thanks for, for chatting with me. I really appreciate it. I know you've been in the batting lab, right? Yes. And, you know, there's all this data on the screen, right? How did you feel about the data? Surprised me how they could get that much data out of six swings. What, what have the results been that you've seen? Are you hitting it harder or? Yeah, the exit velocity is also getting faster. Nice, how much faster? At first, my highest exit velocity was 44, I think. Now it's 61. Wow, that is a lot faster, almost 50% faster. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm a nerd, you know, I, I like to think in percent. So with Jared, the data scientist who is in charge of overseeing this whole project, again, absolutely incredible. I'm really interested in to the inner workings, like what's going on behind the scenes, what sort of models are being implemented here, and how is it making all of this this beautiful interface possible. So the data source that we use here is we partnered with North Carolina State University with their baseball and softball programs. And we went out and captured from their dozens of players, we captured hundreds, almost a thousand swings. And from that, then we began to do, to analyze those swings video based in order to kind of identify what is the optimal swing look like for a division one baseball or softball player. We start, you know, artificial intelligence, computer vision within there. And then within artificial, within computer vision is pose estimation. So we use pose estimation technology to go ahead and be, pull out where all the joints were over the process of that swing. And so we took across those hundreds of swings, we created kind of this average model. And so we developed a state space model that was basically a 38 dimensional time series of how the joints interact during the process of that swing. And that's the basis for how we're comparing the individual player's swings with their physical movements across the, the swing. What types of results can are these kids hoping to achieve? What is the like primary KPI? Having having a career in data and analytics, like I hope that all these kids enjoy and love data. And I think that learning how to analyze data and use data and see data around you is going to be just as important to these kids as learning to read was for past generations. It's going to be essential. Um, from a baseball improvement perspective, the thing where the primary KPI we're looking at is the exit velocity of a ball on a line drive. So that's if these kids want to play in college, that's one of the first things their coaches are going to look at is how hard do you hit a ball off a tee on a line drive. The preliminary results that we've had are that mo every player has improved. Most players are hitting the ball between 10 and 15 percent harder now than they were. Some players have almost 20 percent of their swings are higher than their max on that first session. Well, I mean, one of the kids that I talked to earlier, it sounds like she improved almost 50 percent, which is pretty incredible. Yeah. Off the top of your head, you know, what the average exit velocity for someone 
who is like a division one prospect would be? So the so I have, I have a child who's a high school baseball player and aspires to play in college. Yeah. And so the, the moment where he's been told is that you need to be able to hit a ball 85 miles an hour off the tee to, to, to be considered for a division one baseball. You need to be able to hit a ball 85 miles an hour off the tee. You need to be able to hit a ball 85 miles an hour off the tee to be considered for a division one baseball. There you go. First one. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> coach, call me. You know, I see this problem a lot in business where we see the code, we see you running these models all the time, but we don't see where the payoff is. Is that something you're trying to do here? Is like, hey, there's, this is a real world thing. Sports, everyone understands that. Absolutely, and I think more than that, what we're really trying to do is get these kids to understand they don't need to grow up to be a data scientist. They don't even need to grow up to be in a STEM career. They just need to grow up and do whatever they're passionate about. But what they need to understand is that data is the key to helping them solve whatever problem they want to solve. And so that's what we're teaching them here, that here's they, we want to help them become a better batter. When they grow up, they're going to be passionate about something else. And we want to make sure that they're equipped with those skills to help them change the world no matter how they want to do it. I um, learned to better like hit the ball better like in actual game. And it's like improving like the contact I make and the exit reload that I get on the ball when I hit the ball. What has your experience been with, with data throughout this whole process? Has it well, changed how you think about it? Um, yeah, it has. I usually I uh, used to not think about data too much before this, and now seeing ways that you can like use data in like the real world every day. Like for example, like traffic lights, use like data to see how like when the cars like go to the light, like when to turn green or red. So I think about data a lot more. That's amazing. Yeah. I wish I was thinking about that when <laughs> oh, you were 13, right? Mm -hmm. And I wish I was thinking about that then. I would be a lot richer now. Thank you so much, Drew. You absolutely crushed yeah, no it problem. today. For a break, I got a tour of the SAS campus. And honestly, this place rocks. I mean that literally, of course. The founder, Dr. Goodnight, has one of the most impressive and diverse rock and gemstone collections in the entire world. Dr. Goodnight founded SAS in the late 1960s as a statistical analysis system for agricultural data. Since then, SAS is now used in nearly every industry, and the organization has grown to be one of the largest privately held software companies in the world. Their 900-acre campus in Cary, North Carolina is truly out of this world. Ha! So Jared, a lot of people are really interested in how you go about tackling a video analysis problem. Can you explain what that looks like? Sure, so one of the first challenges we've had to deal with was how do we know when the swing happened? Um, there's a lot of things that happen in characteristic and so um, the, the, the shortcut we found is basically we look at the audio of the file and we look for the sound of the ball hitting the bat. That's a very distinct audio signature. And so we have a microphone in the cage that basically identifies that. So the cameras are basically running on a seven or eight second ring bot loop and when they hear that contact, then it cuts the video. And so we get several seconds before and a couple seconds after, and that gets packaged up and processed and shipped off. So we take each of those videos, we basically take that video and split it up into a bunch of individual pictures. And then in each picture, we process it to get the pose estimation, which then turns into kind of that rectangular data set that most people think about when they think about data. So we have the XY coordinate of all the joints on that body that we can then use to process through on a frame by frame basis to check for the deviations of that player compared to our, our optimal or average swing from the Division One baseball and softball players. You, you have a, like an optimal swing, which is the average of the individual Division One baseball players and softball players, and the kids, how much their swing deviates from that average is how much they need to improve. How do you rank the improvement uh, that they need, or how do you, you score it? Yeah, so we get, it, we get it basically, we get some likelihood scores that happen on, on a frame by frame basis. Then we use that to help locate the, fo the area of the swing. It means the most improvement, it's the, mo it's the most room for improvement. And then what we do is that we, we've worked with the coaching staffs at NC State, both their baseball and softball programs, to kind of identify the, f the areas of the swing, the prioritization types of um, improvements that could happen in each phase. And then we kind of map that back with some specific language that would be age appropriate for these players to receive. 
It wasn't just the gym that helped me hit it faster. The algorithm at the batting lab recommended that I transition my weight better as well as get my hands further behind my head when I took my stride. The kids are not just relying on the machine learning to tell them what to do. They're also relying on coaches and, and parents and teachers. Can you talk a bit more about how that interaction between the human element and the sort of data-driven uh, element comes together? Yeah, because that's what these kids are going to have to do, right? Right now, we're preparing these kids for a future that we don't yet know. But what we do know are that machines, coding, machine learning, AI, this is going to be part of their reality. And so, you know, this new concept of teaming with AI, where humans have to work together with AI, AI isn't coming for our jobs. It's coming to help us be more human, be stronger humans and so that's what we want the kids to understand as well is that um, again no matter what they're passionate about AI can help and so we just have to work together and that's going to be true for their coaches and their parents today but tomorrow it's going to be them there's a computer screen over there with a bunch of Python code and you know we're, we're at SAS like well, what's the deal with that why why is there so much uh, well, my, my good friend Python why there? yes so we use SAS for doing the modeling we use SAS for doing the scoring those products but uh, we also use some open source we use some containerizing technology like docker we use cloud technologies and so and we use some Python as well to kind of glue some of those things together um, in order to make things easier one of the things that SAS has spent a, a good amount of time and I personally have spent a lot of time is doing integration between R, Python and SAS over the last several years. And so, you know, the inputs that we receive here in this model, you know, it's an, M it's an MP4 file and it's a JSON file. And so SAS has that ability to import and export and interact with open source technologies that, um, you know, just work seamlessly for developers. While it might be a bit too late for me to pursue a professional baseball career, the SAS batting lab showed me that it really is never too early to start learning about data literacy. Almost every day in my work as a data scientist, I see people grasping for real world examples to explain how valuable machine learning can be to teams and companies. I don't know if I've ever seen a clear use case of how these tools drive success than I have here at SAS. I figure if these kids can translate these data driven insights into better outcomes, then businesses better be able to as well, or else we might be in trouble. <laughs> and that's the shot. That'll be, no, right. That'll be an outtake. <laughs>